Hi hey everyone, this is lecture, sorry about that, this is lecture 2.1, Core Concepts Regarding Race, uh, for our Dynamics of Difference course. So, I really liked this quote from page 83 of your reader. Minorities are told, in essence, we can't give you a loan today because we've discriminated against a member of your race so effectively in the past that you have not been able to accumulate any equity from housing and to pass it down through the generations. Uh, this is talking about the essence of race in the United States. It's not just that some people don't like black people or some people uh, don't like uh, Mexicans or that whatever. It's the structure of our society. It is the way our society is put together that continues the ramifications of past discrimination. Um, so we will build, give you the building blocks for uh, that explanation of race in this lecture and then in the next lecture uh, we will talk about uh, that structure in more detail. And by the end of this unit you will understand um, structural racism. So let's talk about basic definitions. Um, effectively, and you probably remember this from Social 101, race is a socially constructed classification of individuals based on appearance. So race is a social construction. It is not inherent in our human biology. Um, it is there. It, it's, it's fascinating, actually. We found this in the late 1990s when we first unlocked the human genome there are no sets of human genes that can really um, be identified that means this person is black this person is white uh, it doesn't exist uh, what does exist is your sp skin pigmentation maybe what your hair looks like your facial features those are part of your genetic code but there is no specific uh, set of genes that says that what that means is that the way we classify humans based on their appearance is a social construction. Um, yeah, which is fascinating to me. Uh, so race is how we group people based on their physical appearance. And then ethnicity is how we group people based on their common language, their religion, their food ways, etc. So some examples of races would be black, white, Latino, and to use Latino as a race is, um, there's a lot of discussion to be had around that, but, uh, so what, what I say is, we, we can kind of use it as a race, but there are certainly greater discussions to be had. Uh, but when we talk about ethnicity, we are talking about uh, culture, we are talking about language, we are talking about food ways. So examples of ethnicity would be uh, German American, um, Somali American, uh, Mexican American, or, or Mexican, depending if you just got here. Um, so we have race, we have ethnicity. Another basic uh, definition is prejudice. Prejudice is an action. I'm, I'm sorry, is a belief. Prejudice is a belief that certain classes of people are somehow inferior or other classes are somehow superior. Uh, to other people. So believing that white people are smarter than uh, all other races. That is an example of prejudice. It, it, believing that black people or Latinos are uh, less intelligent or lazy. That is prejudice. Discrimination is action based on prejudice. So it's action based on a belief that uh, people are different. Um, it is possible to be prejudiced and not discriminate and um, we can't really prove it, uh, but is the belief of many sociologists, myself included, that there are many prejudiced people among us that don't discriminate, um, which is what's it, frustrating. Uh, just for clarification, just to sh show you what we're dealing with, uh, this is uh, a breakdown of racial and ethnic populations in the United States. Uh, the numbers aren't exactly perfect on this breakdown, but they do show us a good general picture. 
Uh, there are about 65% of the U.S. population is white. I'll read the numbers first, then talk about it a little bit. About 16% of the U.S. population is Latina. About 12% is African American. About 4.4% is Asian. That includes both uh, people from East Asia of Chinese, Korean, Japanese descent, but also people from India. Uh, two or more races, 1.8. And then we have uh, smaller groups. Now you might look at this and think there aren't that many white people. Or you might look at this and think there's way more black people. That is probably dependent on uh, where you live. Different areas have uh, different uh, proportions of demographics, right? I am sure that in New Mexico you have more Latino people than I do here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, it really is dependent on your region, but the total numbers in the United States is that 65% of the population is white. Um, a lot of that population, that white population, lives in the countryside, and other minority populations um, have a tendency to live in cities. Uh, it is a little bit different in the Southwest with the rural Latino community. Um, yeah, it, it, and this is amazingly fascinating because when I ask students, does this right, look right, does this not look right, it really is dependent on where I'm teaching even within one city. Uh, if I teach in a rural area and I say, does this look right, uh, if students say, yeah, yeah, most of the people around here are white, actually it looks like these minority populations, that's more than I would expect. Um, and then when I teach uh, downtown Columbus, my students say there aren't that many white people because uh, most of those, uh, maybe maybe most, a lot of those students are uh, African American or uh, Hispanic uh, with some Asian population. Um, but yeah, those are the numbers as they exist. And this, there's not an actual year on this. Um, I think this is from the 2010 census. Uh, and our population hasn't fluctuated that much in the time since then. So yeah, they're pretty accurate numbers. Anyway, moving back to definitions. Uh, xenophobia. Xenophobia is a general term for fear of people who are different. It's a real blanket term, uh, but it's still useful. It can be applied to talk about race or ethnicity. Um, it's usually when we use it, we talk about race or ethnicity. Um, but it can also be applied to a fear of gay people, fear of other religions, fear of people from other political parties. It's a real super blanket term to mean people that are different than you. Uh, so we talked about prejudice. We didn't talk specifically about racism. Racism in one context is prejudice against people based on perceived race or ethnicity. And yes, the term racism applies to both race and ethnicity, even though race and ethnicity are different concepts. Uh, we don't have a great term for ethnicityism, so we just call it racism, unfortunately. Uh, but as I'll go on from here, racism is also a system of oppression. It's also a structural thing built into our society that goes beyond what people believe about race. If we only had to deal with what people believe about race and not structural racism, uh, the issue of race in the United States would actually be much simpler. Um, one thing that often comes up is this concept of colorblindness. And this was a very popular ideology in the 1990s. Uh, people started, mainly white people, started saying things, oh, well, I don't see race, I don't see color. We're just one human race. Well, that's that's a nice idea, but you do see color. I mean, unless you're not looking at people, you, you see if someone's black, you see if someone's Latino. Um, and this idea, this mindset masks the harsh reality uh, against discriminated communities. And it doesn't, it, allows people to ignore it, saying, well, I don't see race. Race doesn't matter to me. Well, if you want to stop racism, 
race should matter to you because you need to understand how that thing impacts people uh, like you, like like the given race we're talking about. You need to understand the phenomena in order to change it. That's one of the cornerstones of sociology. Uh, a better solution is to actually address issues caused by racism. So we can't properly address police brutality if we do not uh, understand uh, racism in the United States. Uh, and that is a very com I could easily teach a whole course on police brutality. Uh, housing educate housing and education segregation and inequality in the United States. Um, the education system in the United States as it exists is not legally se segregated, but it is de facto. It is in reality rather segregated. Our schools are, um, are fluctuate dramatically in terms of race demographics and in terms of class demographics from school district to school district. And why is that? It's because our um, living uh, situations, our neighborhoods are segregated uh, by class and by race. That, um, that is very real. Uh, racial profiling. Again, this kind of relates to police brutality. It relates to other things as well. Um, these are all caused by both the idea of r racism uh, on an individual level and structural racism. And we cannot address any of those things if we just say, we're just one human race, man. We, we need to get to the crux of the matter, right? Uh, if you have a mess in your house, you do not fix the mess by saying, I just don't, I don't see a mess. You know, I don't see a mess. That doesn't mean that the mess isn't there. Uh, different societies have different concepts of race. Uh, and this attests strongly to the social construction of race. What is white or black varies from place to place, uh, varies from one part of the country to another, varies from around the world to another. If they varies based on time period to time period. Um, uh, for example, uh, in the early 1900s, when many uh, Italian Americans were coming to the United States, uh, they were not in general considered white, uh, which is very interesting. So Sicilian uh, Americans from Italy, they have a darker skin tone, and they were uh, generally considered non-white. Uh, in Europe, there are people known as uh, the Gypsies, or more specifically the Roma. The Roma is the more acceptable term for this group of people. Uh, it more talks about their ethnicity, but there are many Gypsies who are not Roma. Gypsies is a relatively insulting term, so we don't really like to call the cult. We don't like the term gypsies, it's insulting, but Roma doesn't apply to everyone. It's a very complex thing. Anyway, the gypsies or Roma. Uh, Aborigines in um, Australia. We don't have Australian Aborigines much in the United States. So it's not really in many of our conceptions of race. Or the Laplanders in Scandinavia. They are an indigenous population within Scandinavia that have not integrated into the rest of society. Uh, to uh, most of us, they would look like white people, but they have, they are a distinct minority group with distinct uh, cultural definitions. So let's talk about more complex definitions of race now. And this is a reminder of dominant group and subordinate group that we talked about in previous lectures. Uh, much of our current race problem can be traced back to the legacy of slavery and colonization. So where the structure of race, that structural definition of race comes from, is from our history. It has been built over time. And uh, this goes back to what groups are dominant and what groups are subordinate. Reminder of that definition, the dominant group is the group in society with the most control over the economy, politics, and culture. And then that control creates privilege. Privilege is a series or system of benefits attributed to members of a dominant group. 
you might have been exposed to this reading. You can do a simple Google search to find it. Uh, Patricia Hill Collins did a uh, work called Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack uh, to talk about white privilege. Uh, it is a relatively uh, abrasive piece. Um, if I really want to get a group of students talking about uh, a subject, I bring up Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack because it gets people talking. Uh, but the point is that if you are a member of a privileged group, you have certain advantages in society, and those advantages are called privileged. Uh, and that is something, a conversation that's been coming up more and more in our society. And we're going to continue to talk about privilege uh, for the remainder of this course. Um, just because you have privilege doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you even want that privilege, but you need to acknowledge, I need to acknowledge as a white heterosexual uh, cisgender male, I need to acknowledge that I have privileges that maybe some of you don't have. Um, it's, it's part of our society. And to say just because you don't like that the thing exists mean you can't ignore it. It's, it's part of our society. The fish doesn't necessarily like that it has to live in water, but it's still a fish and it lives in water. Anyway, uh, just a note, the dominant group is typically a numeric majority. I think I already discussed this at a different point in the course. Uh, subordinate group, then, is the group or groups that do not have control in society. And people of color in the majority of at least Western civilization uh, are almost always relegated to subordinate groups, especially in our society. Uh, even in some societies in Africa or uh, some parts of Asia, uh, white people, uh, because of the history of colonialization, um, because of the structural issues, uh, white people tend to be higher in the hierarchy in many parts of the world uh, because of the way white people dominated the world in the 1800s. It goes back that far. It goes back even farther. So because they are in subordinate groups and do not benefit from privilege. Uh, people of color are disproportionately poor. They're disproportionately underemployed or unemployed. Uh, people of color are disproportionately segregated in poorly resourced communities. So, uh, again, when we talk about segregation, right? Segregation was a very specific legal policy in the American South in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And it is, it is illegal now. That was de jure segregation. The reality is de facto segregation still exists in many places in the world. I live in a community that's predominantly white. If you drive two miles to the west of me, there are neighborhoods that are predominantly black. There are no laws saying that we must live in these neighborhoods. But this is the reality of the place that I live, and I'm sure many of you people you live. Uh, people of color are uh, disproportionately threatened by stereotyping, bigotry, and hate crimes. Um, other subordinate groups uh, suffer similarly to people of color. So women, LGBT people, disabled people, religious minorities, all of these people uh, suffer from their lack of privilege uh, in relatively similar ways. There are uh, differences between groups uh, in how they are discriminated against, but um, it's the same general phenomenon. So, intersectional identities. I do believe I talked about this previously, but this is something we will talk about over and over. Uh, are identities that, when combined, make up our entire sense of self. Uh, some of our intersectional identities are subordinate, and some of them are dominant. I am sure most of you have at least one intersectional identity that is dominant, that is a identity with some degree of privilege. Um, race and ethnicities are two of, two of many intersectional identities. So your race or your ethnicity, or your race and your ethnicity, are one intersectional identity. Sex is an intersectional identity. Class is an intersectional identity. Sexual identity is an intersectional identity. 
and age is an intersectional identity. So using myself as an example, I am white, that is my race. I am uh, German American, or more specifically Pennsylvania Dutch. I am male. I am middle class to working class, depending on how I feel. Well, anyway, we'll talk about that in a different course section. Uh, I am straight. I am, um, at the time of this recording, 35, right? All of those have privilege associated with them, besides may maybe Pennsylvania Dutch. It's kind of a marginal thing. I'm an incredibly privileged individual. I have a lot of privilege. Um, yeah, but if I was, if I was, for example, female, if I was, for example, an older person, I still would be privileged because of my race, because of my class, um, because of my sexual identity. If you have any questions, this is a big idea. Uh, so if you have any questions, please let me know. And I, I know we've talked about this a little bit more in the past, um, and we'll talk about it again. Now let's talk about how race intersects with some of those other identities. So in so a little bit of a history lesson, and um, the next if the next uh, lecture is a big big history lesson. So bosses played workers in the 1930s uh, against each other based on race because they could right because it was okay to be racist in the United States in the 1930s. Uh, racism exists today, but it was just something you did in the 30s to be racist, and it was okay. Um, it was acceptable. So, unions went on strike. Well, the premise of a strike is that if nobody works, the bosses have to listen to workers. And the unions that were striking were predominantly white, and bosses took advantage of that. What did they do? They brought in non-union workers. A non-union worker that is used to break a strike is called a scab. Uh, and if the scabs work, the strike cannot be successful and union, union workers lose everything, right? Um, it is absolutely taboo in union culture. So in this scenario, if you're a union worker and you're probably a white working class worker, that is taboo. That is the worst thing you can do is to try to break, work with the boss to break a strike. Uh, Jack London uh, said that after God had finished the rattlesnake, the toad, and the vampire, he had some awful stuff left with which he made a scab. A scab is a two-legged animal with a corkscrew sole, a waterlogged brain, and a combination backbone made of jelly and glue. Where others have hearts, he carries a tumor of rotten principles. Judas Iscariot was a gentleman compared to the scab. F he, for betraying his master, he had the character to hang himself. The scab hasn't. He, there is nothing lower than a scab. And that, that sums it up, right? That sums up what it means to a union person to break a picket line. And that still holds up largely to this day without the racial component. So you're put in this situation, right? Imagine you are someone involved with the strike or you're living in a city with a strike or you're one of those workers. What does the strike and what do scabs mean to you if you're a white working class man? Well, if you're a white working class man, you probably agree very much with Mr. London. If you're a white upper class man, you're still white, you're still a man, right? You probably have a very different uh, idea, right? Because you might even be one of the owners of the factory, right? So you have a completely, you think that the strikers are completely unjustified, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you're a black working class man who has been excluded from the union, you just see, you see an opportunity for work. You see an opportunity to help your family you see, and the, this union excluded you from the very beginning, right? So who cares what they think, right? And that's, that's where those intersectional identities diverge, right? 
or if you're a woman, right? Um, if you're, it, that would probably depend on uh, whether you were married or who you were married to, whether you have an opinion on this matter. Um, these are our intersectional identities. Another example of race intersecting with class, intersecting with gender, was the Women's March on Washington on uh, January 21st, 2017. Millions of people, not just women, but millions of people marched to protest the election of Donald Trump and his perceived stances on gender equality and other social issues. Um, supporters were encouraged to wear pink, what became to be called pussy hats. Uh, the election was very close, uh, but Trump's strongest supporters were white working class men, right? So keep that in mind. Remember, I'm sure you remember this. It wasn't that long ago. Um, so what do you think about this women's march on Washington and around the country if you are a white working class man, right? What do you think about these women marching if you're a white working class man? And then maybe if you're a Republican or a Democrat, it makes a difference. Maybe it doesn't. If you're a white upper class woman, what does this mean to you? If you're a white Christian woman, well, are you evangelical Christian? Are you conservative Christian? Are you maybe a Methodist or a Presbyterian, a more mainline Christian? What does that mean to you? If you're a black working class man, what does this thing mean to you? Um, one of the criticisms of the Women's March on Washington and that movement in general is that there were o vast over uh, representation of white women. It was overwhelmingly white women. So what does that mean um, in terms of intersections? Why weren't black people participating? You look in that picture, I see one black woman in a sea of white people. Uh, and one man, but it was called the Women's March on Washington, so it's not that surprising that men weren't there, right? Uh, well, there were men there, but beside the point, but you expected more black women. What if you're a trans person, right? What does that mean to you in terms of participating in this event? Um, these are our intersections and how our intersections come into play with each other. The last portion we have here is talking about the fact that we are not in a post-race society, and this is a common misperception. Those who study race generally agree that transcending race should not be in our goal. Should not be our goal. And progress has been made in our society, but we are not post-race. Some people said that once Obama was elected president that we were then a post-race society. Um, and we were at no point even anywhere close uh, with Obama being the president and being post-race in race evaporating and it actually doesn't have much to do with the president. Uh, we are very far from being post-race and there's a possibility we may never be post-race and it might be that like we said transcending race shouldn't be our goal. And the, even though it is now largely unacceptable to be overtly racist we still see racism in our society. Why? Well, implicit bias has a lot to do with it. And we talked about that before. So people are racist without even knowing it. And then in these ugly moments of tough decision, when there is a, someone in a dark alley that you think has a gun, you make a split second decision. And then you made the wrong decision that's where that comes into play, right? Uh, or the system of racism, the structure of racism, which I touched on in this lecture, but I'll touch in much greater detail next lecture. That is why we still have racism in our society, even though it is not cool to be racist. And that system took centuries to build and will probably take centuries to destroy. And that is our lecture for today, for this moment. Uh, so uh, let me know if you have any questions and I will talk to you in one way or another soon.